Oh my God. The last week or two has just been insane. I mean, I thought Google, that was a good story and there was a lot to talk about and it was, it was interesting and there was a lot to say, but that kind of was kept going and it didn't end. And, you know, when I did the show last week about Google, they, that, that morning they had fired him, but it still goes on because he's since then, the guy who's been fired, the Google, famous Google memo, has been fired. He's done interviews and, and uh, Google has kind of gone upside down. And of course, the press has commented and the, the left press and the right wing press and the conservatives have commented. So there's a whole, the whole thing around Google. And says, actually, I don't know if you know this, but there's a Google March. Let me, let me find this Saturday. This Saturday, there's going to be a um, whoops, where is it? Google March. It's called March on Google. You can participate. Uh, it's um, uh, we'll get to March on Google in a minute because it's it's part of this big attack on Google by the right. It's it's uh, it's organized by a you know former member of the alt right who, when the alt right got too racist, is now calling what he is the new right. Yeah, right. He's as alt right as they come. Anyway, you know he's organizing this, and there's a big march on Google in like nine cities or something, some something like that. Um, so Google, you know, I thought, okay, there's a lot to talk about Google, and of course Google raises gender issues and it raises uh, the whole issue of um, uh, evolutionary psychology. And I thought, okay, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot to do here. There's a lot to say about this. This is pretty cool. We could we could talk about this for for a while. And then, of course, what happens on, on the weekend in Charlottesville, the, 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 the tragedy in Charlottesville, the riots, the, the death of, of, this, uh, of this woman, the, uh, the, the, you know, 19 people landed up uh, being injured. I, I, I don't know how badly, but, but certainly being injured. And um, that now, and, then, and so that was, that was enough. But then this Trump's response, and, and, but this is the gift that keeps on giving, right? This Trump's response the day of, this Trump's response two or two days later, and then this Trump's response today, and like, this is you know he he can't dig himself a hole big enough uh, to bury himself into, but but of course he's not digging himself a hole. He's he's got a he's got a strategy and he's playing by the strategy. He's got belief in his strategy in his in his he, he believes in these beliefs. So. Um, Anyway, here we are. Now, out of the Google and the um, Charlottesville uh, issues and, and uh, shows that I did over the last week, a lot of questions have arised, and you guys on Facebook and Twitter and elsewhere, questions, attacks, uh, discussions, whatever you want to call it. Uh, some, of them, some of them were questions, some of them were attacks, some of them were other stuff. And a lot of it was interesting, and of course, the, the events since then are interesting. So I thought I would spend today kind of wrapping up, doing a Google Charlottesville fallout, follow-up, whatever you want to call it, show, and try to, try to hit on all the issues. Of course, I think the best way, if you want to engage with me uh, on these ideas, is to actually call and, 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 and talk and, and ask a question and, um, and have a discussion. So if you want to make that live, you're welcome to. The number is 347 324 3075. Uh, That's uh, 347 uh, 324 So uh, uh, feel free to do that. Now, uh, those of you who are veterans of the show know if you do that and you want to ask a question, you have to press the, the one. You have to press one so that I know you want to ask a question and then it appears on my. Um, on my screen here, although I'm using Firefox today because no other, no other, um, what do you call it, uh, browser worked uh, today. So hopefully it's the same thing with Firefox. But uh, if you if you uh, put a one, then I will know uh, you have uh, you're called and uh, you want to ask a question. I'll just call in to listen to the show. Um, all right, what else? Uh, I guess I guess what, what what should we start with? What is uh, what is the most interesting to start with uh, that it get me riled up? Anybody? Uh, um, all right. So, so let me let me. If somebody mentions this on the on the um, on uh, the chat, you know. So, most political violence seems left against right, right? 
A couple of days ago, a guy killed his neighbor because he, the neighbor, was a Trump supporter. I mean, I hear this a lot. You know, these Nazis, I got this a lot. I, I couldn't believe it. I was going to tear my hair up. These Nazis and KKK, they're peaceful. They're not violent. You know, it's the left that's violent. The right is this, they're these peaceful people. They, they were just marching. They didn't do anything. Now, let's start by the fact that you're talking about Nazis. Nazis. And KKK. So, yeah, these particularly Nazis, these particularly KKK guys, maybe right now are not violent, but their whole ideology, everything they believe in, and their predecessors in the movement were unbelievably violent. Like, like killed, you know, in the case of Nazis, over 10 million people. And in the case of the KKK, they string them up and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and they just, uh, you know, they strung them up and they lynched them and they killed, you know, hundreds of thousands probably of, of, uh, of black Americans. So, um, you know, they are, they are incredibly, they are incredibly as movements violence, but it's, but it's more than that. There's violence constantly uh, from, uh, from these groups that we just don't hear much about, but it happens all the time. Whether it was uh, the guy who stabbed those people in, um, in uh, Portland, Oregon, that I talked about, I think, on one of the shows. Um, you know, the car driver, wasn't he? Didn't he murder somebody? Didn't he kill? Didn't he act violently? Um, y- you know, these people. And, and oh, what about that kid who walked into the church uh, in uh, South Carolina and literally butchered, what is it, seven, eight, nine people at point blank? I mean, I don't know of anybody other than this leftist who shot the congressman who went with a gun and actually went out to kill people. And I'm not I'm not saying that, you know, but the the idea that these groups are, oh, no, these are these are just nice people. The other one was the other one was I was going to get it later. But the other one was, uh, and uh, well, I mean, Donald Trump said this. There were a lot of good people at the march at the at the protest on this weekend. Not everybody was a Nazi. Not everybody was a white supremacist, this a KKK. There were some good people there. Really? I'm sorry, but if you march, if you march with people with swastikas or with Nazi symbols and KKK, you are just as bad as them. You are just as bad as them. I don't care if you agree with their particular issue about putting down the statue, but really? Really? If you march with neo-Nazis, you are the equivalent of. So the right, this idea that the right is not violent is ridiculous. We just don't, I mean, the left has been recently more organized around its violence than the right has. Uh, Antifa, stopping people from speaking, uh, beating people up, using pepper spray. Luckily, they haven't started shooting people. But the right, people influenced and people, members are, people who participate on chat boards and people who participate on things that have to do with white supremacists and, and Nazis have killed lots of people. A violent, a violent all the time. But you know, we're, since many of you consider yourselves on the right, you don't, you don't think of them as being on the right. I mean, there is today a violent left and a violent right. A violent left and a violent right. And to minimize that, to say this one more violent, that one more violent, let's count the casualties. I bet you if you actually counted the number of people killed, including the cop killers, if you want to attribute some of them to BLM, right? Even if you count them, I bet you that over the last 10 years, more people have been killed by the so-called right the racist um, right than have been by the left. But it's a stupid, it's a stupid um, project because the fundamental is both are violent, both are evil, both advocate for evil ideas, both must be condemned. And the idea that, and, and, and not only must be condemned, but you cannot in any way associate yourselves with them 
if if Spencer is part of the alt right and you want to be an alt writer but you're not a racist, you can't call yourself alt right. Call yourself something else. Invent a new term. You cannot be in the same umbrella as Nazis and racists. And by the way, it's the Nazis and racists who invented the term the alt right. So you're joining them. You're joining them by using that term. You cannot march with a bunch of Nazis and claim innocence. You are, by marching with them, declaring yourself a Nazi. All right, the boards have lit up. People want to talk. All right, hi, you're on the Ron Book Show. Who's this? Uh, go, this me? Yeah, go ahead. It's you. Yeah, so I, uh, I have a couple things to say, one of which being the most annoying thing about the left is that they put you in the very awkward position of having to somewhat defend some of these other people because, in my opinion, while carrying a swastika flag is disgusting, it's not necessarily violence. I agree. So you can't justify them attacking them. I agree, but if you saw the videos, and, and uh, Ben Shapiro showed a bunch of these videos, you will see that both parties initiated force at various points during the protest. It's not true that this is all Antifa. He has, he has it on video where the, where the white supremacists go, ah, let's go after them, and they rush the crowd. Uh, the guy who drove the car into the crowd that was a, 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 a Nazi, whatever he is, initiating force. So, yeah. so I agree. They have a right to free speech. And I'll talk and about that, the police, the real default here. Let, let me, let me sorry, finish yeah. and then I'll let you speak. The real default here is that the police didn't aggressively separate the two groups, didn't aggressively protect the peace, which is their job. But uh, the idea that this is always the, the, the left that is causing the violence, it's just factually not true. Go ahead. Right. And no, I don't think that um, either one side is morally superior to the other. They're both guilty of the same things. But particularly with the car, um, I keep hearing these different reports from, you know, the mainstream media on the one hand, and then you have people who claim to have been there saying that he was trying to flee and that his car was surrounded. So it's hard to tell, at least from my perspective, what actually happened. Well, I mean, but if you look at the if video, you, if you it's believe in free speech. I, I mean, it's video. So maybe I'm wrong. I, I'm willing to always agree that I might be wrong and there might be another side to this. And, and I hope that the legal system is such a will we discover if there's another side. But if you look at the video, he's going into the street full of people with, with two cars in front, you know, uh, and he steps on the accelerator. He steps on the accelerator and it's all it's not like. There's a lag there. He steps on the accelerator, and then you hear screaming, and you, you see people rushing and, and rushing towards the, 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 yeah, surrounding the car in a sense, and he backs. I don't know where he killed her going forward or going back, but the point was that this guy was going in at full speed and then reversing at full speed. Um, no justification for that. that I mean, and, and if you read a little bit about this guy who, uh, who used to be violent towards his mother— I mean, this guy's a nut. I mean, why anybody would even try to defend him unless, unless there's real evidence out there. We'll see. We'll see. But um, I, I doubt it. Uh, he went in there with the intent to do harm. There's very little doubt looking at what, looking yeah. at what, what the video suggests. One more thing before sure. I uh, – Sure. Give but up but, but I agree with you. Uh, right um, to free speech is shared by all these nut cases, right? Yeah, and I would defend both sides' right to free speech. I do too. But about the, the yeah. violent aspect of it, from what I've been told and what I've heard, a lot of the people on the right wing came pretty heavily armed, yep. and nobody actually fired any shots, which to me says that they didn't go there intentionally to be violent, or at least most of them didn't. Well, maybe they, maybe they decided they were afraid. They did go there with, uh, with signs attached to pieces of wood that were clearly intended to hit people. They went there with shields and with helmets, knowing they were going to fight. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind they went to be too violent. They, they, they were smart enough um, to realize that if they started shooting, 
the consequence to them would be horrific and it would destroy the rest of their lives. But, but there's no doubt in my mind they went there to fight. They went there knowing that they were going to they were getting into a fight, and and the left did the same. By the way, if you look at the pictures of the uh, of Antifa, they were there with helmets and pieces of wood, you know, attached to signs so the police couldn't take them away because of the issue of free speech. But the pieces of wood attached to the signs were so thick and big, it wasn't to protect, it wasn't to hold up the sign, it was to beat people over the head. And both both Antifa did this, and the, and uh, and the white guys did it. There's no question both parties were looking for violence. I mean, there's no question in my mind. And if you think about who these people are and what they've achieved through the violence, they've achieved, they, they've, they've achieved um, um, visibility and coverage in the media that they would have never achieved otherwise. So they've achieved exactly what they set out to do, which is, which is to expand their movement. And I think they are. And the more we, we find excuses for them, the more – they are emboldened to expand their movement, a movement that is evil and that we should do everything in our power to not allow to expand, everything in our power short of physical violence. But we should, we should argue against, we should debate against, we should, you know, everything we can. All right. Thanks for the call. Right. Hey, thanks. Appreciate thanks for it. taking the call. Sure. Uh, we've, got, we've got a couple of others before I get on to some other points. Hi, you're on the Iran Book Show. Who's this? Hello? Yes. Go ahead. Yes. Um, yeah, this is uh, Mohammed from Jersey City. Hi, Mohammed. How are you? And the yeah. Uh, I just finished watching the vice mayor of Charlottesville go on CNN and you know defend what appears to be defend Antifa, and it just it just got me really upset because like on on the one hand you have Trump's uh, whitewashing of uh, the people uh, on the right, saying some of them are good people. Um, and on the other hand, you have a lot of people, especially CNN itself, uh, trying to make it seem as if there was literally no violence from the left. There really is no such thing as a left-wing violence problem. Uh, I don't think they see it the way we see it, which is this is a replay of like the Weimar Republic type of thing. No, I think you're right. I, I think I think most of the most of the media. Uh, ignores left-wing violence, most of what's going on, you know, it, 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 most of the culture, most of the intellectuals ignore left. Not all of them. You, you, you know, if you go to the Atlantic magazine, you'll find an excellent piece about left-wing violence written by a lefty where he, he is condemning it and he is pointing it out and he gives lots of examples. And, and it's very good. It's a very good piece. And, and there's, a, there's others. They are the better people on the left who have called Antifa out and who 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 wrote about um, what happened to Charles Murray? Who wrote about Berkeley? Who wrote about Evergreen and condemned it? So they are definitely better people out there. But there's no question that um, Antifa by the by the main media gets a free pass, and there's a reason for that. And I, I got somebody on Twitter saying this. They said, "How can you compare a bunch of Nazis to people who just who want to fight fascism and who are just for equality?" It goes back to something else I've discussed on my show often, which is the fact that communists and socialists get the free ride. They get a free ride everywhere, everywhere, right? And uh, communists and socialists get, have always got a free ride. They kill 100 million people, and they still get a free ride, right? So why are we surprised that Antifa is getting a free ride for, for pepper spraying? I mean, that's not even killing 100 million people. So if you're on the left— you're basically allowed to do anything, and history and the intellectuals and the media don't judge you. And uh, it, it, it's, it's tragic, but that's where we are. But the answer to that can't be to justify violence on the right. The answer to that can't be to downplay violence on the right. What happens in Charlottesville is disgusting because it was neo-Nazis and KKK people going up and marching and 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 incite and in a sense inciting violence, it, it's their fault. Uh, it's their fault a hundred percent, and um, you know they have to be condemned. And there are plenty of other opportunities to condemn Antifa. There's plenty of others, right? And we can we can keep doing it, but we shouldn't miss the opportunity to. And I think it's an important opportunity. And I think I think we in objectivism or you know the. What are we going to call ourselves? Uh, uh, Laissez-faire capitalists have to differentiate, uh, differentiate ourselves from 
the uh, the alt right, and we need to use every single opportunity, every single opportunity, uh, to do so, to do so. Yeah. And I mean, and 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 people on my chat, I mean, Mark on the chat is, I mean, the the, the BS. Um, he lived in the South. He never met a he never met a uh, a KKK member. Hey, I hitchhiked in the South for for one week, and I met plenty. And I met people who hated Jews. I met plenty. So I'm not saying they're everywhere, but there are plenty of them. And they're out there, and they were marching in Charlottesville. And you're going to see this march on uh, Google. Maybe they'll be there as well. So I don't, I think, I think the worst thing, the worst thing that objectivists can do is associate in any way with the right or the left, for that matter. But, but there's no... There's no real risk of that, although, of course, these idiots call me a, a, a leftist. But um, associating but in any respect, in any respect, uh, with the, with the alt right, and and uh, and I and I see too many apologists for the alt right, for the for for what happened in Charlottesville, for the violence of the right. Too many in people who claim to be affiliated. With the uh, laissez-faire capitalist, uh, uh, laissez-faire capitalist ideas. All right. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Okay. I, I think that it's also further complicated by the fact that uh, everyone on the uh, right wing that went to Charlottesville, I think, was pretty bad. But the counter protesters were mixed between some people that were kind of good and some Antifa. So I don't think every counter protester. Uh, I, I think that's right. A lot of the people there were not Antifa, it, but everybody who was there on the right was a bad guy. Sorry. Everybody who was yeah. there on the right was a bad guy. And the reason they were all bad guys is because they agreed to march shoulder to shoulder with neo Nazis and KKK. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's all I had to say for this. Thanks. Appreciate it. All right. Um, yeah, we're stirring up a lot of uh, a lot of. Uh... Hi, you're on your own book show. Who is this? Hi, you're on. This is Upton from Gig Harbor. Hey, Upton, how are you? Washington. I'm great. Um, to me, the the biggest problem uh, these two events of the the Google thing and the Charlottesville thing raise is the threat to our free action of the police. So in Charlottesville fact that they're not out there preventing the violence and defending our rights gives the left cause uh, more cause to oppose free speech uh, as, yep. as they've been slowly yep. moving forward over the last few years and then the events at google give the right cause to work start working towards suppressing corporate free speech and yes i'm going to get to that the greatest danger <laughs> here i agree with you i think the biggest threat at the end is the suppression of free speech the more violence we have and the more irrationality and just stupidity we have, which is what, which is what I think the whole, uh, a lot of what happened around Google was. Uh, and by the way, a lot of what happened with Google, well, we'll get to Google, but is, is the danger that it poses ultimately to free speech. And uh, you're going to get forces on the left and forces on the right, and you're going to see them aligning with each other to attack free speech. And, and look, the United States government, has defaulted on its responsibility to protect the free speech of American citizens since 1989, since the Solomon Rushdie affair, when American publishers uh, were threatened, where bookstores were bombed, and where when George Bush Sr., in this case, um, went on television and said, eh, you know, it's not good to criticize Muhammad, and, you know, you really shouldn't write these inflammatory books. And, yeah, 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 I believe in free speech, and I'm not, we can't silence the author, but, you know, you shouldn't really do that, and, you know, I can kind of understand. And, and his father did the same, his son did the same thing during the Danish cartoons, and then Obama did the same thing with, uh, with uh, uh, you know, uh, Charlie Hebdo and, and, and everything else going around free speech. So, You've got a string of Republican and Democratic presidents who have no clue about free speech, who apologize for whatever free speech we have. And now, you know, and, and, and add that to the attacks on free speech that are going to be generated from what's going on uh, now. Yes, I think free speech is the number one issue in America today. It's the number one freedom that or the most important freedom under assault, under unbelievable assault. Um, Anyway, uh, so it's, it's, uh, 
it's horrible. Now, let, let me just, thanks for calling. I really appreciate it. Let me just say about the police, because I think it's a really crucial point uh, that was made about the police. And this is true on the campuses. This is true all over. The idea that the police are there. The police know about these demonstrations well in advance. And the police are basically instructed to stand down when violence is being committed among Americans, among groups. I mean, this is not. This is, this is completely wrong. The police is there to protect the right, even of neo-Nazis, to speak free of violence. The, the, the police is there to protect the right, even of, even of, and Antifa, to speak. What they don't, either group has a right, is to action violence. And if they do act violently, then... You know, then the police have to step in, separate the groups, keep them separated. And from everything I've, I've read and heard about Charlottesville, they completely blew it. They completely blew it. And uh, But they blew it in Berkeley, and they blew it in every place, every place where they, they're, they're blowing in Portland every weekend, the, the, these demonstrations and fights. And they just let them fight. That's not civilized. That is a... Breakdown of the rule of law. I don't know who's responsible. Who are the mayors or who are the heads of police who are responsible for this? I know they're trying to protect the lives of the policemen. Or maybe they're afraid that one of the policemen will shoot somebody. I don't know. Maybe if one of the policemen actually, if the police got violent, maybe that's a solution to this. But you've got to stop the violence at these events. And the only entity that has a legitimate way and a legitimate cause for stopping this is you know the uh, the police all right uh, let's see let's quickly look at the chat you know somebody should uh, you know next time I'm just gonna mute you mark because uh, on, on the on the uh, on the blog talk chat you, you just you know what you're saying is 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 just BS and it's meaningless and there's no free speech at the Iran Brook Show. <laughs> My show. All right. Um, let's see. We got, yeah, we got tons of callers. Hi, you're on the Iran Brook Show. Who's this? Hello? Hello? Ron? Yep, go ahead. I think you made uh, all the points I was going to make about when you just the last thing you said about the police and what the uh, local governments are doing, but I think people on the right who are at least tacitly supporting political violence on the left, you know, disregarding the moral issue, which is obviously the most important, yep, but yep. on a tactical level, what what they're doing is only going to further bring about some sort of, you know, authoritarian crackdown on, on their ability to speak anyway, because if you look at what happens at these events, at some level, either at the state, the state or local government or the police themselves, somebody is being told not to protect somebody else's right to speak. So yeah. the more that you try to use violence to combat that, the more you're giving them an excuse to further crack down on things they don't like. And clearly yeah. at some level, yeah. most of these governments are – at least tacitly supporting the leftists. So I don't, I don't really understand what the right, other than an emotional release of hurting people, wants to gain from all this. It's well, it's an emotional you know, release. You know, but it's the, it's a hoping to get. I mean, what they want is publicity. Um, and and look, violence breeds violence. You, you'll always get this. This really is the red shirts uh, fighting the brown shirts in the streets of German cities in the 1930s. This is where we are today. And and it, this is and and this is it's always. In a sense, it, it, well, not always. In a sense, it's the left fault because they, the left's fault because they raised the whole issue of identity politics. So they made it all about race and culture and, and oh, the whole intersectionality. And the right has responded, although the right, the racist right has always been there. But then modern racist right is kind of responding, all right, you want identity politics? We can do identity politics. This is our identity politics. Our identity politics is fascism. So you have fascists on the left and fascists on the right. Um, but the only solution to this is violence. There's just no other way. There's no other way 
to compromise. There's no other way to, to moderate. There's no other way to any other way. The, the, the left and the right today are violent. The alt-right is a violent movement. The alt-left, if you will call them that, is a violent movement. And uh, they need to be dealt as violent movers. That is, the police should be monitoring should, to the extent that they're organizing violent activities or encouraging people. That's incitement. To the extent that they're just dabbling in so-called ideas, then they have obviously the right to free speech to engage in it. But these are violent movements that need to be dealt with and when they go and protest, the, 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 uh, the police need to be fully prepared and fully ready to make sure that that violence doesn't escalate into wider violence. So, you know, so that innocents don't get hurt. So, but that's the battle. And it, this might be a little more. Yeah, go ahead. It's, I know it's a little more complicated question and it, it you know, might be a whole nother topic, but. Would the government have a a right to say, you know, in when it comes to public protests, that like if you're associated with these known violent movements, you just you're not allowed to protest in a public space, whether you plan to be peaceful or not. I because think it's not like I think anyone it's anyone on the alt right or yeah. left could claim. I think at some point it can come to that, it, it, but I don't think we're quite there. I don't think the violence is such that that we, that the government has a legitimate. Uh, now, it can stop a protest. It can say, we're not allowing this protest because it's going to be violent. They can do that. If they have intelligence that it's going to be violent, or if they have probable cause that violence is going to happen, you know, the courts, I think, will, will, will protect them. That, that you, can't, you can't just, uh, you know, you need a permit to protest in, in public spaces. And if there's uh, real reason. That to believe that the protest is going to result in violence, yes, the government can stop the protest from happening. All right. Um, All right. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's see. We've got another string of callers here. Um, look, the only answer to alt left and alt right, even though the New York Times says there is no such thing as alt left, I'm just making up that term. I don't know if there is such a term. Uh, I take the alt left to be. Antifa, let's call it the violent left, the violent left and the violent right. And the people, but everybody associated with the violent left and the violent right. So it's not just the people committing the violent, it's not just the inciters, but the entire intellectual structure that allows them to get away with it. Um, and that's what I call, that's why I like the old left and old right terminology. These are, you know, the nihilistic left, the regressive left, the regressives. The left are regressives, but what are the right? They're regressives too. So it's regressives on the that, – that's the best term. Uh, left regressives and right regressives. Um, and I, I, I have said before, and I'll get to why I'm not on the right and why I don't think the, the term right needs to be um, fought for. Uh, what are we uh, – all right, you know, so the only thing to do with the old left and the old right is to recognize their fundamental similarity – and, and that similarity is around race, uh, racism. They're both racist. Um, they're both irrational. They're both mystical in some deep sense. And um, so they're anti-reason and they're anti-egoism and they're certainly anti-capitalism. They're anti-individualism. So an individualism wraps together both the politics and the ethics. So they're anti-reason and anti-individualism. That's their essence. They're all racists. And that's the level at which they need to be fought. We need to fight them. We need to crush them because they're gaining more and more adherence. They're gaining more and more power. They're gaining more and more followers. And we need to recognize that and we need to fight them because otherwise this country is going to hell. It is going to hell. The, the, you know, unless we rise up and start defending ourselves from right and left, unless better Americans come back to the core idea of what America is, individualism, reason, then we are sliding whether into a dictatorship of the left, a dictatorship of the right. It doesn't really matter. That, that authoritarianism is where we are heading. All right. We are going to take a, I should have taken a break uh, a while ago. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back after this. The Ayn Rand Institute fights for the future. Throughout history, people all over the world have been fighting tyrants in the form of kings, dictators, and governments who propagate the immoral idea that your life 
does not belong to you. This is why the Ayn Rand Institute is important. We promote Ayn Rand's philosophy, objectivism, that not only teaches you as an individual the principles needed to live a happy and successful life, but also the moral foundation for striving to achieve such a life. Ayn Rand said that anyone who fights for the future lives in it today. Join us in that fight. Go to AynRand.org today. Perfect ad, perfect commercial for what I have to say, which is we need a fight. We need a fight today because this world is slipping away from us at an ever-accelerating rate. Um, and uh, and what you're seeing, what you're seeing today, is nothing as compared to what is possible and what is waiting for us if we do not stop this movement of towards violence uh, again, violence of the left and violence of the right. And unless we stand up against it and find allies on left and right who are willing to stand up against it, we will perish. This country will end. All right, uh, we got we got some more callers. Hi, you're on the Iran Brook Show. Who's this? Hey, can you hear me? I can, but you got to speak up a little bit. Oh, sure. Better now? Yep. I don't know. Your connection's bad because it came out garbled. Try again. Uh, any better now? Yeah. Try, just try to try to just yell it out. Okay. Got it. Yeah, I had headphones on, so it's a little bit hard to hear. So there are two quick observations I wanted to make. Uh, one was made by a prior caller, but I think it's very important, and that's the connection to uh, violence and Reds versus the Browns. Yep. And uh, I think it's very, uh, you know, prescient because we know that the Browns won that conflict. Uh, and they did so by really demonizing the Reds and posting them as a real threat to the stability of Germany. Yep. Uh, of course, Colbert is a significant. You know, I can't. So I, I, concern, I'm sorry. Try dialing and calling back again because I. We, we, I just can't hear you. Half the words are gobbled, and I think you've just got a bad connection. You're probably on some cell phone with a very weak connection. So try dialing in, try joining in again. But I think the point you were making about Weimar Germany, I think is absolutely right. And I made the point, I think so, it's one of my previous podcasts, that in the battle between a violent left and a violent right in America, in Germany, in a lot of these places, the right will win. The right will wrap itself around the flag. The right will present itself as patriotic. The right will present itself as pro-order and pro-stability. All the left has to offer, and this is an important point, all the left, like in, in Antifa and the rest of the, the academic left at our universities and elsewhere, have to offer, is destruction. They have no vision. They have no something they're striving towards. I don't even like calling them Marxists because they're not Marxists. They're not as good. You know, Marx had a vision. Marx believed in something, moving towards something. I mean, it was evil and horrible and evasive and, and stupid and everything. But the modern leftists are not Marxists. They're, you know, Marx had some principles. He had some ideas. He had the belief in terms of how society is structured. These people don't believe in that. Indeed, the left today is the response of the intellectuals when they rejected Marxism. The left today is postmodern, and the postmoderns are not technically Marxists. I, you know, I know I, people throw out this cultural Marxism stuff from the Frankfurt School, but the postmodernists are not cultural Marxists. The postmodernists are nihilists. They are out to destroy, they're out to pull down, they're out to... Rip apart. That is the essential characteristic of the modern left. That is the essential characteristic of Antifa. You give them way too much credit by calling them Marxists. But Americans will never go for destruction for the sake of destruction, for nihilism, for hatred of the good, for being the good. Americans, in a, in a challenge, in a struggle between a nihilistic left and a violent right will always go to the violent right. 
And they'll do so just like many of you do. Oh, they're not all racists. And oh, I was just marching with them. I wasn't really, you know, a Nazi. Right? It was, it, you know, it's, um, it is a, I believe that in this battle, the right is going to win. And, and you know, it's, a, it's, it's a horrible to contemplate, but that's where I think, that's where I think uh, we are heading. Uh, I think that was it. Yep. Um, all right. We got another caller here. Hi, you're on the Iran Book Show. Who's this? Hello, speak up. 540 Cute. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Hi. Yes. It's me? Yes, you. <laughs> All right. Hi, Yaron. Hi, Yaron. I am calling for Black Tour, Virginia. I am actually from Costa Rica. Um, related to what you were talking about, about uh, collectivism here in the United States, you know, I don't know if some uh, somewhere in the past collectivism has been so popular in the United States as it is right now, but uh, as a foreigner, uh, I have always uh, looked at the United States, you know, this country that stands for freedom, for values like individual rights around the world, and so on. So my question really is, I guess, do you think uh, at the end of the day, individualism has, like, some chance of... of uh, <laughs> Like sometimes, you know, repealing all, all these garbage that you, uh, yep. that we are getting right now from both left yep. and right. Yep. So that's a, uh, a great that's question. Really kind of my question. Yeah. So I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on. I'm gonna I'm gonna hang up on you. I apologize, but the sound quality wasn't that good. Uh, the question is, really, bottom line is, does individualism have any hope? Do we have any hope? And my answer is yes, absolutely, we have hope. We have hope. As long as, we sh as long as we do it right, if we don't compromise, if we don't sell out, if we don't adopt the, 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 the cloth of nationalism and Trumpism or Donald Trump and alt-right and all this garbage, as long as we stick to our guns, as long as we identify individualism and reason as the ideas that must guide us, as long as we fight for those ideas and as long as we watch who are allies, who are enemies, and never make an ally, an enemy into an ally. Never. Whether on the left or whether on the right, and you have to realize that they're all enemies out there. Right? And, and people who disguise themselves as, as individualists, but are actually deep, deep, uh, collectivists, I mean, one of the shocking things about what's happened over the last year with the alt-right is the number of people who call themselves objectivists, who talk completely, thoroughly in terms of collectivism, in terms of groups, in terms of uh, my people and their people and, and brown people and white people and black people and yellow people. It's, let me put it, it's disgusting. Go away, people. You are disgusting. And you're not part of the objectivist movement. You're not part of the freedom-loving movement. You're not part of the laissez-faire capitalist movement. You are the enemy. And you're the worst enemy than anybody because you are people who have, or at least pretended, or at least been exposed to the truth, are rejecting it and pretending. So you're doing damage to objectivism by associating it with people like yourselves, like the alt-right, like Spencer, like everybody else. It, it just is, ah, it's just mind-boggling. The, 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 hopefully, I, ultimately, I don't think there are a lot of them. They just, they just get on my nerves, and all it takes is one of them on one of these chats to, uh, to send me off, uh, off the deep end. All right. Whoa, look at, the, look at the board lighting up. Hi, you're on the Iran Book Show. Who's this? Speak up. Oh, we already talked, I think. 540, we talked already. All right, this is 313. Hi, you're on the Iran Book Show. Hi, this is Jennifer in Michigan. Hey, Jennifer. Am I coming to speak at Michigan, uh, Michigan State? Yes, the 17th of October. 17th of October. 
anybody out there in Michigan, uh, you know, you can, uh, you can, uh, you can come and, uh, and my talk and, uh, um, yeah, it should be fun. Yeah. Um, I was wondering about the police. You were saying the police are, they're not very effective. Yep. They're just standing around. And I was wondering if maybe some of the, the good, the better policemen are intimidated by the reputation that the police have had in recent times because of the bad ones. And they feel they won't get support if they are more aggressive in cracking down. So it makes them impotent and they just yep. stand around. Yep. Do you think that's possible? I think that's possible. I think that's possible. I, I don't think it's a primary reason. I, I think there's a certain mentality there of let the two groups fight it out. They're all evil. Let them go at it. I think there is overprotectiveness of the police themselves. I don't want to get hurt. But I do think there is yeah. this element of, because of Black Lives Matter, of, of, of the fear that one of these policemen will hit a protester or, or will, will do something to protest and injure them or kill them or something, and then people will freak out. Uh, people will, get, you know, uh, will attack that policeman and he won't get support. So I think that is an element, and, and there have been some... Reports, I think it's still inconclusive, but there's some evidence that suggests that police are generally more fearful of engaging because they fear um, that they will not be protected if they do something, uh, you know, something violent. Yeah, I was thinking maybe that has something to do with it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, but you would also think, though, that given that Donald Trump is president, given that Jeff Sessions is at the Justice Department. Both of them, I mean, Jeff Sessions has basically withdrawn the Justice Department from investigating uh, police forces where they might have been excessive force. He doesn't believe in that. He's given, and, and you, heard, you heard Trump the other day tell policemen to be rough, not to be too gentle with the people that they, uh, that they arrest. So you would think that now with the Trump administration, that would go away and that the, that the police would be emboldened. So... You know, you still wonder. You still wonder what's going on. I, I don't know. Now, it is true that a lot of these events are happening in leftist cities where the mayors and, and, and the police chiefs might be leftists. So it's, it's really hard to tell. But all I can say is the police is defaulting on their responsibility. Their responsibility is to keep the peace. That is essential. And they're not. They're not. They're letting people initiate violence. They're not punishing the people who initiate violence, but also not preventing them when it's, it's an imminent danger. And that is wrong. That is that it goes against everything that the police should stand for. And I haven't yeah, seen a lot of people commenting on that. All right. Good. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thanks, Jennifer. Appreciate the call. All right. We got one left on the, in the stack. Hi, you're on the Iran Brooks show. Hey. Hey. What's hey, up? Uh, this is Ara from New York. Hi, Ralph. Um, so I just want to ask you, how, how big do you think the alt-right is? Because uh, initially, I thought that it was just you know, a bunch of people online, really, not really anything, you know, a big movement. But do you think that has changed? Or really, do you think they're just this is just a fringe movement? Or do well, you think this is fairly dominant? It's fringe, but it's growing, and it has a lot of sympathizers. I, I don't know that the core of it ha has a lot of people involved. But I think it has a lot of sympathizers. It has a lot of people who are apologists for it or engaged with it. I see some of them here on the chat. Um, and, uh, and, and they're all over social media. But originally it was... It was it, people like Milo, right? Well, Milo's, yes. Right. Milo's made it a much bigger movement than it needs to be. Milo is definitely an apologist for the alt-right, for the worst elements in the alt-right, not even for the so-called moderate alt-right. I mean, the things that Milo has said in defense uh, or in explanation of Spencer and some of these out-and-out -out racist is disgusting. Now, I think he just does it because he thinks it's funny, but he's too smart not to realize what he's doing. So I, I consider Milo part of the alt-right, even though he would deny it, and the alt-right probably doesn't want him because, because, uh, because he's gay and, and, and weird and everything else. But I think he is. He's definitely an apologist for them. What's that? <laughs> Oh, he's also half Jewish or all Jewish or something. But the fact yeah. is that he's an apologist for them. Read his article in Breitbart about the alt-right. It was kind of the definitive piece written at the time about the alt-right. And it's a, it's a, it's a whitewashing piece. It's, it's, a, it's a piece that basically is, is um, 
you know, uh, making them out to be not so bad and the good elements and they're just a response and it's a bunch of kids and Spence is not that bad. I mean, it really is a travesty, a real travesty. And, and, and this is why, you know, I think Milo is horrible. I think, I think the way he, 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 he purports himself is horrible. I think his ideas are disgusting. I, I, you know, he can be funny. He's clearly smart. But you, I, I'm, I'm very, 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 very much against supporting Milo in any way at all. Again, an apologist to neo-Nazis, an apologist to the KKK, an apologist to people like Spencer is evil. Is evil. Right. Well, I, I think that... Amy, it's, it, it, so somebody's asking members. about Spencer. I think- Let me be very clear. We are not talking about the Spencer who specializes in MIDI studies, uh, who is Catholic and, and who's done a lot of work on, on Islam. I mean, I, I don't like certain things that he's yeah. done and some things he represents. We're talking about, I think it's, it's Richard Spencer, right? Uh, who is right, an sure. alt-right leader, leader of, the, of, of this. Uh, of this uh, uh, he's on television a lot. He was in Charlottesville. He co- he's been commenting a lot on Donald Trump. He's everywhere, but it's a different Spencer. There are two Spencers. I once confused the two, and one's, I think, Robert, and that's the, 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 the Islam expert, and the other's Richard, who is a neo-Nazi. He's, he's the worst type of person you could imagine. Um, so, yeah. so, uh, don't confuse the two, don't confuse the two guys. Uh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. And when it comes to Milo, like, I think he just misrepresents the movement. Like I, like, I think I watched him once on, he was on the show and he was saying like, this movement is about individual liberty or this movement. But that, really that's about, the danger. You know, that's the danger, right? right? Because they hear Milo say, I'm for individual liberty and we're for individual liberty. And then, and then he says the most outrageous, horrible things. Just, just, just his language is just so offensive. I find. I mean, you know, it's one thing. It's one thing to, to say outrageous things in the face of, um, in the face of uh, censorship, like Lenny Bruce did in the sixties and seventies. But it's another thing to build your whole shtick around saying things that, I don't know. Maybe I'm getting old, but you just don't say, and you just don't. I mean, it's. I, I don't know. I, I find it I find it horrible. Yeah. But it's it's more than that. It's then he associates with the alt uh, alt right. He apologizes for the alt right. And then we because he's for individual liberty and alt right, people in their minds think alt right, individual liberty, those are the same things. No, 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 no. And and we need to be very 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 clear. They are not the same thing. They are the opposite. The alt right is the enemy of individual liberty. The enemy of individual liberty. And then do you, I don't know if you know the Milo attacks on uh, on Ben Shapiro. I mean, Ben Shapiro oh, yeah. is a good guy and, and was supposedly on the same side as Milo. And the disgusting attacks when, when, when uh, Ben Shapiro had a baby, the tweets that Milo sent out, I mean, it, yeah, I it. it's just unspeakable, you know, suggesting that the baby is, was a consequence of his wife sleeping with a black guy. Th- that's what <laughs> Milo felt it appropriate to tweet the day that Ben Shapiro had a baby in, in the form of congratulations. I mean, uh, it's not funny. Yeah. It's not funny. It's just, it's just bizarre. Anyway, thanks for the call. Yeah, Keep on listening. I Appre- appreciate you guys' support. All right, we're going to take another uh, quick uh, break. And uh, when we get back, I want to talk about um, Donald Trump and his response. Looking for inspiration? Follow us on Instagram at Ayn Rand Org and get your daily dose of inspiring quotes, stories on how Ayn Rand fans connect in remote places, as well as updates on our popular student programs and upcoming events. You'll also see which celebrities are reading Rand and posting about it. Follow us today at Ayn Rand Org, A-Y-N-R-A-N-D-O-R-G, the official Instagram feed of the Ayn Rand Institute. See you there. All right, we're back. Quick breaks, not too bad, huh? Um, all right, let's talk about uh, Trump's. And I talked a little bit about Trump's response right after the incident in Charlottesville, which uh, 
which I thought was weak and pathetic and, and, uh, and, and didn't say anything really. You know, everybody, who's not against hate? Everybody's against hate. Everybody, you know, we're against hate. And America needs to unite. Unite around what? What, what is this unity? What, what is it all about? Um, so, uh, you know, he was criticized heavily for those statements, as he should have been. And then um, he was, and then he later, I guess yesterday, is today, yeah, today's Tuesday. On Monday, he came out with a prepared statement that condemned uh, neo-Nazis and racists and so on, what he should have done the first day. Uh, but it was a prepared statement, so then he was criticized for be- having a prepared statement. Now, granted, the left is going to always criticize anything that Trump does, but you know, sometimes he actually deserves the criticism, so you have to go with the, uh, with the media. Um, but then, today... Uh, Trump uh, did some uh, 15-minute Q&A, and it turned into a discussion about, about, uh, about Charlottesville. And, uh, and again, you get to see his thinking about this, and I think it's much more reflective of his first uh, statement. So um, first, he, he blamed basically all the violence on the, what he's calling the alt-left. And, um, you know, video evidence just counter, but but basically shifting again. Uh, it's all about the violence of the Now, he does point out to the media, look, media, um, you guys, uh, you guys, you know, are blaming the right on everything, but you never show off when the alt-left is violent. And he's right. He's right. The media clearly under, under uh, reported on Berkeley and on Evergreen and all these other places. They underreport leftist violence. The, the violent left gets away with murder, almost, right? But, um, but he goes on and on and on. So uh, he goes on to, to kind of almost defend the alt-right. I mean, it's just it's a bizarre. So let's start with his, uh, his, uh, the issue of the statues, because I know some of you, some of you disagree with me on the, uh, on the statues, um, all right, so he came, he came out and said, uh, here's what he said. I, I, so this is about uh, taking down a statue of Robert E. Lee. I wonder, is it George Washington next week? Uh, and is it Thomas Jefferson the week after? You really do have to ask yourself, where does it stop? George Washington was a slave owner. Was George, uh, and he says, well, I can't repeat everything because he, he just repeats himself. Uh, and then he goes, uh, are we going to take down his statue? Because he was a major slave owner. He, he says the same thing, like, 55 times. Uh, and then I say, they're changing history. They're changing culture. Now, to compare um, Robert E. Lee with George Washington is absurd. Now, true, both owned slaves. But Robert E. Lee fought for the preservation of slavery. He led the armies fighting for the preservation of slavery. Robert E. Lee and slavery are one and the same. Robert E. Lee fought for that. He didn't stay neutral. He didn't say, you know, uh, I love the South, but I disagree with the stance on slavery, and I can't fight for the North, so I'm going to just stay home and not participate. No. He joined the military. He was made commander of the military. He killed other Americans for the sake of sustaining the institution of slavery. He is not a hero. He is not a good guy. I mean, yeah, he was probably a nice guy socially, but that's not the point. Now, to compare that to George Washington, who I wish had not owned slaves, or to Thomas Jefferson, who I wish had not owned slaves, who had major achievements who ultimately made possible the abolition of slavery completely, both as, as, uh, both because of the Declaration of Independence and the, and the American Constitution and bec- because they created America. Because they made this historical country. They, they made it possible. So yes, they were flawed. They weren't perfect. But Lee, what counterbalances in terms of statue? What is the only reason we have statues of Lee, of Robert E. Lee? The only reason we have statues of Robert E. Lee is because he commanded the armies of the South. That's the only reason he's on a statue. If he, had ne- if he had not participated in the Civil War, there would be no statues of Robert E. Lee. 
<sighs> so to compare the two is absurd, given George Washington and Thomas Jefferson's achievements. So that's one. So it's true, though, that you don't even know about the left. You, you could see them going after statues of George Washington and, and Thomas Jefferson. And when they do, we should defend George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. We should be out there on the barricades defending them, not with the neo-Nazis, not with if they're participating, I'm out. But we, those who believe in the founding of this country, those who believe in the founders, those who believe in the principles of this country, Yeah, I mean, somebody's asking about a statue of Rommel. Now you sh there should be no statues of Rommel in terms of celebrating the guy. He wasn't a great guy. He was a general fighting for the Nazis. There are no great guys fighting for the Nazis in positions of power. Even though towards the end of the war he tried to kill Hitler. Not for the right reasons. No, Rommel is not a good guy. He's an evil bastard. Sorry, I'm getting carried away a little bit. <laughs> but you don't celebrate. Now, does that mean you destroy the sculptures? Does that mean you, 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 you destroy them? No, of course not. Of course not. Um, what you do with, sta with statues is you put them in a museum. You preserve the history associated with them. You preserve the history um, that, that they represent. They should not be forgotten. But you do not keep up statues of Hitler or Rommel or Stalin or Lenin. I mean, one of the things that I found most disgusting in my visit to Moscow was the fact that in the mall in Moscow, there was a man dressed up as Stalin, standing around shaking people's hands and getting selfies with them. I mean, <sighs> it tells you everything you need to know about modern Russia. Right, And patriotism is not a virtue if it's in the name of an evil ideology. There's no such thing as a German patriot during World War II. German patriots, people who believed in anything, were in the underground fighting Hitler, fighting Rommel, fighting the German government, fighting the Nazi apparatus. It's not a virtue to be patriotic when your government is evil. Quite the contrary. It's a vice to be patriotic under those circumstances. All right. All right. Um, we are going to take another very short break. And uh, I want to I get into more of uh, Trump's response today because it wasn't just about statues. And, and by the way, let me just finish this point about statues. I think it's quite reasonable, given that the statues on public property, that uh, that each locality make a decision about what to do with it. I think they should all come down if they're on public property, um, and uh, that they should uh, that they should that they should just like just like the uh, the flag of the Confederacy should be taken down from public property. You have a right to have it on pri on uh, private property. Uh, but not on public property, and I think. But it. But I don't see the federal government having to get involved in this. Uh, this is something that can be left to local authorities to deal with. All right. So we're going to take another quick break. If I can get my cursor to do what I want it to do. Uh, yeah, there it is. Found it. All right. We will be right back. The Ayn Rand Archives has more than 1,500 photographs of Ayn Rand, her life, and her work. Become an ARI monthly sustainer today, and you are eligible to receive the Ayn Rand photo series every month. These high-quality reproductions, each with historical anecdotes provided by the archives, will be shipped to you in a protective sleeve and are suitable for framing or for collecting in a photo album. Becoming an ARI monthly sustainer is the most convenient way to contribute. Your automated monthly gift of just $25, that's less than $1 per day, helps to sustain our vital programs and qualifies you to receive the Ayn Rand photo series. When your first monthly contribution is made, you'll receive the first set of two photos. Then for as long as you contribute at at least $25 a month, you'll receive an additional set of two photos each month. For residents outside of the United States, a monthly donation of $50 is required to receive the photo series. Signing up is quick and easy. 
Just go to einrand.org slash donate and look for the link at the bottom of the page to become an ARI sustainer. If you want to get in on the fight, if you want to get in on the fight against the violent left and the violent right, the alt-right and the alt-left or whatever they want to call themselves, the best way to do so is get involved with the Ironman Institute, whether you become a, a sustainer, a sponsor, whether you support this radio show, whether you support our other activities at the Institute. Uh, that is the best way. And if, if you're young and you want to become a real fighter, an intellectual fighter, look into the OAC and into educational programs where you really get an understanding of, uh, of uh, you know, the, the, the philosophy and you can become a, an intellectual fighter for the philosophy. Let me, let me just say, I want to say, because somebody said, Somebody posted on on Facebook or somebody that all I do is, uh, you know, that I hate everybody, that I, oh, I'm always critical of everybody. So let me say something nice about somebody. Um, I, I want to tell you that, that I, I've always liked Ben Shapiro. I mean, I disagree with Ben Shapiro on, uh, on a bunch of different things, uh, but um, I, I've always, uh, I've always, well, that's interesting. Um, I've always uh, liked Ben Shapiro. And... Um, He's really excelling on this issue. So while I disagree with him on abortion, and he's obviously religion, religious and so on, he is excellent. He is the best commentator on the right. He, 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 well, I shouldn't use the term right. He is the best commentator among conservatives. Uh, he has excelled on the issue of Charlottesville. He's been excellent. I posted a video of him on, on, my, face, on my Facebook page where he just nails it. It was almost like I, I jokingly say that, that he's challenging, he's channeling me because, yeah, I mean, everything he said was consistent with I, what I've been saying. Uh, and he, he, he was really, really good. And then today on Daily Wire, he had an excellent piece analyzing, um, analyzing uh, uh, Trump's speech, which I'm, I'm going to refer to uh, in a few minutes, or I'm trying to refer to. Uh, he is, you know, he is Ben. Ben is really, you know, really doing himself and himself proud and uh, i'm proud of him I, you know i don't know him i've never met, met him i'm looking forward to meeting him um, i'm looking forward to debating him i think it'd be a lot of fun or, or to have a conversation with him he didn't act you know and um but i recommend everybody follow follow ben you're not gonna agree with everything and he's definitely a conservative and he's definitely religious but um he is um he is definitely better than any other conservative out there today uh, in terms of uh, popular commentators, better than anybody on Fox or any of these other places. So, um, uh, you know, support him. He's a good guy. He's one of the good guys. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, so one of the things, one of the reasons, uh, it's interesting how, um, how, uh, wow. How 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 is uh, the guy unmuting himself constantly? Uh, it's it's weird. All right. Um, so one of the things that uh, that Ben Shapiro points out in his piece is that Trump, um, w when he was asked about yesterday why it took him two days to, to actually condemn the neo Nazis and condemn uh, the KKK, Trump said, "Well, I needed to get all the information," and and, and, and Ben Shapiro calls him on it justifiably completely. I mean, give me a break. Really? I mean, everybody had the information. We all had the information. We knew exactly what was going on there, or at least a, a good enough approximation. And this is Donald Trump we're talking about. This is Donald Trump who tweets way before he has any information. But on this issue, where he's clearly trying to protect, trying to be nice, trying to play nice with the alt-right, he has to get more information. He can't comment. Really? All right. Um, then, of course, he, he argues with the reporter and says, when you say the alt-right, define alt-right for me. Uh, define it for me. Come on, let's go. You define it for me. Really? Really? Everybody knows, particularly in that context, what they're referring to. Right? Um, and then he says, of course, and, and this, is, this is a point I referred to earlier, not all those people were neo-Nazis. Believe me. Not all of those people were white supremacists by any stretch. You had people who were very fine people on both sides. You had many people in that group other than neo-Nazis and white nationalists. <laughs> I talked about this already. You march with neo-Nazis and white nationalists 
and, and KKK, you are one of them. That's what you are. Right? So don't give me this, uh, this, there were good people there. Nobody is good who marches with neo-Nazis. You're sanctioning them. You're granting them. You're basically saying they're okay, which makes you as evil as they are, or almost as evil as they are. And finally, his point, he, he says, and I know some of you won't take any criticism of Trump. I know, I know. That, that's just, what can I do? There were people in that rally, he says. And I looked the night before. If you look at the, the video the night before, they were people protesting very quietly. And, and, and uh, they were protesting the taking down of the statue, Robert E. Lee. Have you guys seen the protest the night before with the torches? With the KKK torches? Have you seen what that looked like? That wasn't a quiet rally. They were yelling. They were fighting. They were yelling, we're going to take the, back this country from Jews. They were exhibiting the, I mean, really very quiet and very fine people. These are very fine people. People mimicking a KKK ceremony. I mean, I have never been a fan of Donald Trump. I have been critical from day one. And yeah, you could argue I criticize almost everything he does because he deserves it. But this is a new low. This is a new low for him. To, 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 to celebrate, in a sense, the, the, the rally the night before. Go watch the video. Watch the video. And, and uh, luckily for you, Ben Shapiro has it up on his site. You can, you can easily follow along. You can easily watch the video. And then, of course, who do you think? Who do you think really celebrated Donald Trump's comments? It was um, David Duke from the KKK and Richard Spencer. They were the ones who celebrated because they know Trump's got our flank. Trump's got us. Now, again, I'm not arguing that Trump is a white nationalist or that Trump is a neo-Nazi, but he does not want to offend those guys. He is protecting them, and he is giving them cover, and he is tolerating them, and that makes him, like the marchers who marched with them, who might not have been neo-Nazis, he is an apologist for them. And that's about as low as any president can get. I mean, you all got, you all went after Obama when he was an apologist for Black Lives Matter. Justifiably so went after him. Where are you now? This president has done the same thing. Same thing. And, of course, you're all making excuses for him. All right, we've got a caller that that must have stimulated. Hi, you're in the Iran Book Show. Who's this? Good evening, Dr. Brooks. This is Skyler. Hey, Skyler. How's it going? Going well, sir. Sorry I didn't take your call on uh, Sunday, I, but I was running out of time. That is not your fault. And I had, a, I had a good rant at the end of that show, so I had to, I had to get into it. Yes, it was worth it. <laughs> Um, but I, I, I remember a few weeks back, a few months back, you were saying you wanted a new name for liberals and conservatives and the left and the right. Yeah. Why don't we just call them the altruist left and the altruist right? Because I don't so think that none of them are, are individuals. Yeah, no, They're it's true. Them. But I think I think collectivism is a better term for them because it deals with them oh, as okay. a political entity. Right. Because they're, they're also altruists in the middle. Right. right? Everybody's an altruist. So what do you what do you do with that? So I think I think if we just focus right. in on their political stand, which is, which is, uh, um, uh, you know, collectivism, I think that's fine. And and what I what I consider them all is collectivists, and we're individualists. And if you if you st and that most Americans get, most people understand collectivism versus individualism. If you take it one step down deeper into the philosophy, altruism versus egoism, uh, that's much harder for people. And there are going to be a lot of people who are basically individualists out there who don't who don't ultimately um, consider themselves egoists so um, that you know that's that's why I think collectivism and individualism are the right terms to use in this context absolutely all right thanks Skyla keep listening thank you Dr. keep Burrow. calling I really appreciate it
All right. Um, so, in other words, we need to we need to call these people uh, for what they are and call them um, call them the collectivists that they are, and and not separate between the left and the right here. They were all collectivists, uh, you know, of various forms. Some of them were worse than others. Some of them were more violent than others, both on the left and on the right. We are individualists. We stand for the individual, not for the group, not for the collective, not for sacrifice of the individual, but for the freedom, for individual rights, for the freedom of an individual to live based on rational values, to live his life, to pursue happiness, to flourish as an individual. That's the essence of egoism. Is, 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 the, is, the, uh, is the use of one's mind to pursue one's values for the purpose of one's own survival and flourishing. That's what egoism is. And that's what we stand for as opposed to the sacrifice of the individual to the group the, 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 the judgment of the individual by a group standard rather than by his character, by his nature as an individual. All right. So um, let's see. What, 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 what have we covered? We've covered, uh, you know, we've covered Trump's comments today. We've covered Ben Shapiro. We have done all that. I mean, there's still some fallout from the Google stuff. I will mention the Google March. Uh, there's a march on Google uh, this week. It's going to be interesting to watch and see what uh, what happens uh, with all of that. Uh, and uh, I, you know, hopefully it doesn't get violent, but there's a good chance that it will. There's a good chance that the alt right is behind these marches. Certainly, the person who's organizing them is a former alt right guy who supposedly has denounced alt right and now is new right. Uh, but that that is something to watch. Um, all right. Oh, I did. That's right. I did want to cover this one point that somebody raised somewhere, somewhere, at some point. Hey, we fight to preserve the term selfish. Why shouldn't we fight to preserve the term right? So, uh, and there are people in objectivism who, who who think that we should be defending the term right. Right really means individual rights. Right really means um, a pro laissez-faire capitalism, pro founding principles. Um, now, I don't, I don't see the point in all that. I, I don't see the point in fighting to preserve this term. This term has always been murky. It's never been clear. There is no clear definition of what right means vis-a-vis -vis the left. The Nazis have always been considered right. Fascism has always been considered right, or at least for a very long time. Now, I don't have, um, I don't have a, a, a complete history of how far this goes back. But right doesn't, as a word... As a concept, it doesn't really mean anything. It's a, uh, you know, it's a label for, for a certain political view. Selfishness is a profound word because it means something. It means taking care of self. And that's, that's what the battle's about morally. Should one take care of self? What does it mean to take care of self? How does one take care of self? Is taking care of self important? That's the qu fundamental question that we need the starting point, in a sense, in ethics. Who should be the beneficiary of one's actions, of one's moral actions, oneself or somebody else? So selfishness captures it. It's a word worth preserving because it's a word that relates to self and the well-being of oneself. So selfishness, we have to fight for it. There's no alternative. If you give up on selfishness, you're finished. Now, does that mean you beat people over the head with the word selfishness? No. I think you can introduce them to the concept by using rational self-interest or by using, uh, by using rational selfishness. There are a variety of different ways one can introduce the term. But at the end of the day, you've got to get to selfishness because that's what it's about. It's about taking care of self. And I don't know if you saw, but uh, there, was a, there was a wonderful, wonderful, really good uh, uh, article in the New York Times, of all places, right? About, uh, and it was written uh, by a mother who says, motherhood is selfish. Stop telling me it's all about sacrifice. It's all about suffering. It's all about, you know, eliminating self. This is, 
I love this. This is important to me. These are my values. Of course, it's selfish. So um, that was good. And she used it for the most part correctly. I mean, the article could have been better. It wasn't, obviously wasn't written by an objectivist. But the idea that the New York Times would publish an article by a woman arguing for selfishness in motherhood, whoa, blows my head and might suggest that we're making some progress. Maybe we're winning a battle here or there. It's great. Let's not walk away from this word. People get it. People get it. Now, yes, they have to get over the emotion. Yes, they've been programmed to think it's an evil, nasty word. Yes, it's going to take them a long time before they get over that emotional response. That's what we're there to help them with. We're there to help them with getting over that, emo- that negative emotional response and, and filling that word called selfishness with content, with real content. You know, and, and here I encourage you, read The Virtue of Selfishness by Ayn Rand. Read, it, read uh, Peter Schwartz's um, In Defense of Selfishness. Uh, you know, educate yourself about what the word means, about the enemies of the word, what altruism really means. And, um, uh, and uh, you know, defend it. Fight for it. Work for it. All right. We are going to take another very short break, and then um, then I want to talk about I want to talk about the backlash to Google. One of the backlashes. Uh, it looks like we're going to have to evolutionary for psychology. I think we're going to have to give ourselves a little bit more time to do. We've only got about twenty minutes left. All right, we'll be right back after this. The mission of the Ayn Rand Institute is to promote Ayn Rand's philosophy of reason, rational self-interest, and laissez-faire capitalism. It's rare for employment to offer you the opportunity to impact the culture and make history. But that's exactly what we do at ARI, each and every day. We are currently looking for talented, passionate, and bright people who share a goal of raising awareness of Ayn Rand's ideas. Visit ari.aynrand.org to learn more about open positions and how to apply. That's ari.einrand.org. All right, so we're going to take one more call, and, uh, and then I want to talk about um, this unbelievable, and let me see if I can find it, unbelievable op-ed that I, oh, not an op-ed, but a, uh, I guess it's an op-ed uh, that I read in Town Hall in terms of the conservative, a conservatives, uh, and it's not a, not just any conservative, a conservative affiliated with Breitbart, a conservative, but it worries me because he's, he's a big supporter and supported by, um, by uh, uh, Donald Trump. Anyway, let's take this call, and then I want to get to that because it's just, it's, yeah. Hi, you're on the Iran Brook Show. Who's this? Hello? 302 area code. I don't know why my phone Oh, you're Scarly, you're still there. All right. Somebody yeah. somebody else was calling and they must have disconnected and they're off. Uh but um let me let me talk about this up at you know, this is uh, written by Kurt Schlichter, I think his name is, who uh, was was personally recruited to write conservative commentary by Andrew Breitbart. He is a trial lawyer a veteran with a master's in strategic studies from the United States War College and a former stand-up comic. And I guess the only thing I can think of is that this piece is actually comedy. But I fear it is not. I fear it is not. Anyway, this is the title of the piece. This appeared in Town Hall. And this guy, I've seen his writings. He's not some nobody. This is a well-regarded person among conservatives. And, you know, I don't know. Maybe this is just being, uh, he's just being, um, Controversial for being controversial, but here, here's the title of the piece, and you can look this up. It's titled Conservatives Must Regulate Google and All of Silicon Valley into Submission. Here's the beginning of the piece Google's fascist witch burning of an innocent engineer, witch burning, right? Um, for refusing to bow down at the ultra politically correct lies was this final straw an unequivocal warning to conservatives that there's a new set of rules and that we need to play by them. Republicans at both the federal and state level 
need to rein in the skinny jeans fascist social justice warriors who control Silicon Valley. And how do we do that? Through the kind of crushing regulation of these private businesses that we conservatives used to oppose. And he goes on. He gives a whole prescription of how they do this. Use antitrust. Google is too big. We need to break it up. And he identifies Google, Facebook, and Twitter. We need to break them up. We need to, we need to dismantle them. We need legislation. He says you don't need legislation to do that. He said Jeff Session is right there in the Justice Department. He can go after Google. He can go after um, uh, Facebook and Twitter. He needs to break them up. He needs to destroy them. And, and we don't need legislation. The Trump administration can do that by itself. Right? Here's another, but, but some things you do need. right? So he, he tells us the, the problem, one of the big problems with Facebook is they know everything about us. And they're going to use it against us. Now, there's an issue of privacy, and, and, and we can talk about privacy. I should have Amy Peacock on sometime to talk about privacy. But here's his proposal. Now, again, I, I don't know if to laugh at or cry. Maybe this is comedy. How about the Algorithm Transparency Act, a law that bans these big internet companies from putting their fingers on the scale of discourse and requires them to make available online all of their operating algorithms? Oh, this isn't about privacy. This is about Google search being biased and only populating the things that the so-called leftists that Google want to populate. So he wants an Algorithm Transparency Act, right? Um, and then he says, then, once they're all available, we will allow an army of Davids to dig through Facebook and Google's code, finding out why, uh, out why things the, the tech leftists don't want you to know are getting buried, and then feeding that into info to trial lawyers, lawyers who would then sue Google. Ah. <sighs> Uh, the other legislation was, this was the legislation of privacy. Um, uh, we need to impose staggering, gut-wrenching monetary penalties, not only on active misuses of this information, but even for the mere failure to safeguard it. Any failure to safeguard it, we must, be, we must crush them. Crush them. You know, he says Silicon Valley giants are just too big. We need to chop them up like old Ma Bell. We need to get an, an army of lawyers busy breaking up these enormous, bloated, anti-competitive conglomerates. Now, he ends the piece with, um, not exactly old-school conservatism, right? Well, it's not exactly old-school America. Too bad. We like the old system, but you tech twerps decided to change it, so be it. Too bad that for some reason you thought we wouldn't change too. All right, so the left has become fascist. We are going to become fascist. He even writes here. What is he? Let me just find this section. He says, free enterprise means enterprise generally free of government control. Now, that's a pretty vague uh, definition to begin with, but so be it. And it's stunning that the Silicon Valley people who hear, uh, who we hear are so smart, don't foresee that when their enterprise morphs into a partisan political campaign, the people on the other side of the spectrum are going to leverage their own political power in response. Conservatives now need to savagely regulate companies like Google, Facebook, and Twitter. We need to use our political power in Congress and red state legislatures to incentivize Silicon Valley to return to a system where its companies embrace political and cultural neutrality. He says, yeah, I know that heavy regula regulating private businesses is not free enterprise, but I don't care. All right, I, you know, what else can I say? You guys know Ayn Rand. You know what I think. Um, you know, the, what can he add to that? I mean, this guy is, is nuts, but, but he's not the only one. Because for the last two weeks or so, Rumors have been coming out of the White House. Now, again, they're rumors. So I don't know, but nobody's denied them. That Bannon, Bannon is strongly advocating within the administration for the heavy regulation of Google and Facebook. 
And then this appears. And this guy knows Bannon because they worked at Bright- Breitbart together. I'm not a conspiracy theory guy, but you know, this is coordinated. You know it's coordinated. And it's, it didn't just appear there, but there was also a story. Where is this? Uh, um, there was also a story from the left saying the left has to recognize now that, you know, maybe it's time to say that you can't say certain things if you're an employee. And uh, we can't have free markets in Silicon Valley. We can't have free markets within companies. These companies, the left is saying, we're going to have to regulate them because there are these people out there who are saying really nasty things, and, and that needs to be controlled. And since the government can't control it, why can't the government control it? Because it's a violation of free speech if the government does it. We need to encourage companies to do it. And maybe there's a way we can regulate companies to incentivize them to control free speech within them. <sighs> this is where we're heading. We're heading towards fascism. And Donald Trump is, and, and these people on the so-called right are marching us towards it. Not necessarily because they're fascist, but because the only logical extension of what they do advocate for is fascism. It is. I didn't vote for these guys. That's all I can say. I did not vote for them. Didn't vote for the other guys either. But I did not vote for uh, fascists on the right or fascists on the left. Um, and, you know, I, I, hope, I hope those of you who have been saying for months and months and months, but he's better than Hillary, I hope you're right. I really, really hope for the sake of all of us that you're right because if Bannon is not fired soon, if Bannon really has as much influence in the White House as I suspect he does, if the people, you know, if, if those are the people who really are influential with Trump, then it's not obvious to me at all that this administration will land up being worse than Hillary, better than Hillary. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Donald Trump at the margins is doing some good things, not because Donald Trump is doing good things, but because he's appointed some good people who are deregulating, who are doing some good things in various departments from education to environment to, to, to energy to others. But um, whether that is enough to compensate for the damage that is being done now to the American spirit, to the American ideas, to the American way of life, to the association of America with, I have no idea, no idea if it's possible to recover, particularly if you really, if you get the government trying to heavily regulate Google and, and Facebook, if you get antitrust um, against these companies uh, speared, uh, spearheaded by, by uh, 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 Jeff Sessions' Justice Department. Um, I mean, we're, this is from the right. We're in deep, deep trouble. All right. Um, I uh, actually want to end on a positive note uh, today for a change. No, well, not just a positive note. I want to, you know, we, 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 I've had this tradition of uh, on the Iran book show of ending with recommendations of positive values. And uh, I know that some of you don't like that because I know there's a big drop-off when I start talking about music or film or anything like that. Big drop-off of, um, of uh, listeners once I start talking about that. But, but a lot of you like it a lot, and I like it. And uh, particularly, um, particularly when... Um, News is so negative, and it's so depressing, and there's so much bad stuff going on from the stupidity of the Google situation to what happened to the evilness of what happened in uh, in uh, Charlottesville. It's good to remind ourselves that there are ways to uh, uh, not to escape, but to alter, to to refocus uh, your environment, to refocus your mind on something different. All right, so I'm going to take a, a quick break here. And when we come back, I want to talk a little bit on some, uh, some classical music that I really love and why music in particular uh, is a powerful, powerful tool when just stuff around politically and everywhere else just is really depressing and bad. Ayn Rand held that art is an indispensable need of human life, an irreplaceable form of spiritual refueling. In the course, Eight Great Plays, available at ARI Campus, Leonard Peikoff selects eight masterpieces of world literature and analyzes them as great works of drama. 
and as works that convey philosophies of life. After completing this course, you will better understand how to reach a full, objective evaluation of an artwork and how to grasp, evaluate, and enjoy the values that great literature offers. Visit ARI Campus at campus.einrand.org today and enroll in eight great plays. All right, that was a great entree into what I want to talk about, which is aesthetics and, and the importance of aesthetics. And uh, that course by Dr. Peikoff uh, on the eight great plays is probably, I mean, it's probably my favorite in many, in many respects, my favorite, because it is, um, I learned so much that I, that I didn't know at all. Um, and it added value to my life immediately. Reading those plays was a really profound experience. Those plays are amazing. And then, and then having Leonard uh, explain them and, and, and not just explain the play, but give you a whole approach to approaching a play. Um, and for years, I used to run movie nights where we would take the approach that Leonard used for plays and apply it to movies. And you know, some of you probably attended my movie nights in San Jose or in Austin, Texas. And it was a blast, and it was fun, and it's enhanced my ability to enjoy movies and plays and, and, and uh, other forms of, of, uh, uh, of art. So I strongly recommend uh, on AOI campus for free uh, Leonard Peikoff's Eight Great Plays. It will, it will have a, if, if you, and read the plays. Don't get lazy. Don't just listen to his analysis. Read the play and then listen to the analysis. And it will have an immediate impact on your life because it'll it'll give you you know art is fuel art is fuel for the soul art is fuel for the spirit and particularly given how bad the news is and politics is and just the, the culture and the environment um and and you're not going to get good art unless you go seeking it that's the other thing pop art popular art is mostly I don't want to say garbage, but superficial at best. To get good art, you, it's not like in Gre ancient Greece. You just walked out your house, and there were the sculptures. and The theater was there every day with great theater. and it was, It's not like the 19th century where you could go into a coffee shop, and there's Chopin and, and, and Liszt and, and Hugo, and they're all there. And it's just there, and it's it, 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 the sculptures, and the buildings are, uh, adorned with, with, with sculpture. There's a whole approach to aesthetics and to and to art, um, we don't have that. You you walk out into the public space today, and it's 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 garbage. What if they put anything out? It's garbage. And if you listen to the radio, it's you know okay. So some of it's pretty, but it's it's superficial. Uh, there is no great art or very little great art being produced today. And it's suddenly, if it is being produced, you have to find it. But it's not just that you have to find. You have to find the great art of the past to give you that fuel. And, and Leonard Peikoff has a number of courses and lectures about this. There's one on poetry, there's the one on great great plays, and there's one that he does on how, um, how uh, great art with a evil philosophical theme is still a value and still fuel and still can energize you as a, as a good human being. And, and actually that lecture was a consequence of a confusion paper. I'll tell you the story one day. But anyway, I would definitely recommend all of that material. Go go listen to Leonard and, and of course, read Romantic Manifesto. You have to read the Romantic Manifesto. I know people are so focused on politics. They don't want to... This stuff has direct impact on the quality of your life, on, on your ability to enjoy your life right now in that pursuit of happiness. The, uh, these are uh, uh, life-promoting values that you can benefit from. Without money... Because you don't need to be rich to enjoy them, uh, you, without um, w without with some knowledge, but without spending four years in college studying uh, all of this other stuff. So, I brought a, a somewhat random stack of CDs with me, of, of stuff that I really like, and it's a mixture. But uh, but uh, let me just say something about classical music, and some of you have heard this before, but um, but uh, classical music, in my view, is just a different different um, cultural level, different aesthetic level, artistic level than any anything popular music can achieve. I, I do not think 
you can get the same emotional response, the same fuel from uh, popular music that you can from uh, classical music. Now, I'm not against popular music. I listen to it all the time. But you've got to have a place in your life, or you should have a place in your life for classical music because it, it is it is profound the impact. So to me, when I, when, I, when I listen to this news crap and all this other stuff, the best thing I can do, and I have to admit, I don't do this anywhere near often enough, is to turn off all the lights to, and to put on some piece of music and, 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 and just to try not to think about anything, just to focus on the music, to focus on the experience of experience the music. This is my form of meditation. Um, is to just focus on the, on, on, the, on the music and the emotions they're evoking in me. It's a form of introspection, but it's, it's focused on the outside because it's focused on the music. But you're also focusing on the emotions at the same time. And just close your... And it's hard because what you'll find is your mind want to drift to what happened during the day, what you heard on the news, you know, what your Ron said on his podcast or whatever. You have to crush that. You have to suppress that. And you have to really... Let your mind focus on the music to get the full experience. And I think this is generally to get the full experience of any art. You really need to be focused on the, on the experience. There's no accident that the best way to mo watch a movie is in a movie theater where it's dark and nobody talks. And you're just experiencing it. Or, or you go to a concert hall and nobody talks. And it's a little dark. And there's a little bit of visual stimulation, but mostly it's just the music. And it's not an accident. I mean, it is an accident. In museums, I think, distort this because you have lots of people and it's noisy, sometimes noisy, and, and many times the paintings are close to one another and, it, and it, you, it's hard to focus on any one piece and really devote the kind of energy and the kind of focus you need to that one piece. So, look, when I'm in a combative mood like I am tonight, uh, I, my favorite composer by far for this mood that I'm in right now is Beethoven. Now, I know that Ayn Rand did not like Beethoven. And, and for good reason, I think. I mean, she considered him malevolent, and, and there's definitely a malevolence there. But hey, Beethoven, the essential characteristic of Beethoven's music is conflict. It's struggle. And when you make that a metaphysical thing, which is what art does, it, it reflects metaphysical value judgment. So when, you, when you're making a metaphysical value judgment about conflict being at the core of existence, that's malevolence. I could get that. But you know what? Give me Beethoven's Seventh Symphony on a night like this any time. I relish it. It is so much energy and force. And yeah, there's a fighting there. There's a fighting spirit. And it energizes me to fight and to continue engaging in this. So Beethoven is one of the secrets, one of my secrets, for how I can sustain, you know, the Seventh Symphony, the Ninth Symphony, the Fifth you're all familiar with, the Third Symphony. Um... His, 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 his piano concertos, three, four, four is my favorite, and five, four is, you know, four, the second movement of the four, fourth uh, concerto leading into, leading into the fifth. It, the, 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 the second movement is piano versus orchestra, and it's piano versus orchestra, and they're fighting, and the piano's clearly the good guy, and the orchestra's clearly the bad guy, and the piano wins, and then it sweeps, and, and it's very quiet and, and very subtle and then it sweeps into this a magnificent uh, final uh, you know final movement of, of the piece uh, fourth concerto I, a lot of people their favorite is the fifth the fifth is fantastic fantastic so third fourth and fifth but then I, I love Beethoven's um, uh, cello sonatas and violin sonatas and his piano sonatas oh some of it is so magnificently beautiful and and, and, and romantic, well, some of it's not romantic, some of it is romantic, um, but, but powerful. There's power, real power in, in, in everything that Beethoven did. And uh, it, it, that clashing of or that struggle, to me, is energizing. I, I get it if people don't like it. Now, if, if you want a more positive, uplifting, also, you know, but, but sweeping, rom truly romantic in every sense, and then you've got it. The piano concertos of two composers, right? And, and, you know, Ayn Rand talked about these, Rachmaninoff and Tchaikovsky. And both of them, with Rachmaninoff, my favorites by far, uh, maybe the two greatest piano concertos ever written, 
uh, number two or number three. I mean, if you just want to just you just want to sink into the music and just drift with it, but just to be immersed in it with the power and, and the romance and the uh, and the exhilaration. If you, if you want to get as close as you can get to Haley's piano concertos from um, from Atlas Shrugged, Rachmaninoff's uh, second and third piano concertos, and then the other ones I would recommend is uh, uh, Tchaikovsky's first and second piano concertos. Again, it, it, with Tchaikovsky, the first is well known, and Rachmaninoff's second is well known. I would heavily, heavily recommend um, the th- Rachmaninoff's third and, and Tchaikovsky's second. I also recommend Tchaikovsky's third and Rachmaninoff's first and fourth. First is weak, but the fourth is also excellent. Um, so um, just just let it go. You know, let it just... just uh, and, and, you know, we can argue about performances and stuff. I'm not going to get into particular performances. There are lots of, there are lots of great performances of these. Uh, but, but it, wow. Uh, and that'll cleanse you. It'll give you a cleansing. Of all the garbage, of all the crap, of all the nonsense that you have to deal with in your conscious mind, uh, from the news and from just stuff that's happening in life, it'll it'll just let you relax and refresh, and and be able to 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 meet the world and and you know it gives you that sense of benevolence. So, uh, so yeah, there's there's a lot and there's a lot of this stuff. I mean, there's the beauty of classical music is there's a ton of it, a ton of it. There's thousands of compositions. I, mean, I keep still discovering new things that I haven't heard before that is wonderful. So um, anyway, um, t- to me, there is no better way. And you can't get that from a movie because it, it's, it doesn't immerse you quite to the same extent. Maybe, and maybe partially because movies are modern. So they haven't been, you haven't seen greatness in movies yet. Not in the same sense as Beethoven and Tchaikovsky and Rachmaninoff were great in music. You haven't seen the Beethoven of movie making, I don't think. So we don't know what's completely possible. So um, I, I think we're poor when it comes to movies. I mean, they're, they're good movies, and I enjoy movies, but uh, and I, enjoy, I, I watch a lot of movies, and I watch a lot of television. I enjoy a lot of television. I'm watching his, uh, his – I've recommended this show in the past. So I'll quickly recommend it again because I'm watching season three of it now. It's a French show called The Bureau, intelligent, smart, um, uh, uh, Action, but without much action, just smart uh, and slow, intelligent, good television, good, suspenseful, exciting, you know, character driven. Uh, so the Bureau, it's on uh, iTunes, it's on Sundance TV. Uh, there are three seasons. I just started season three, uh, so I recommend that. All right, thank you everybody. Thank you for uh, listening. I uh, I hope. Um, Hope to see you, hear from you, chat with you, whatever, uh, next week. Follow me on Twitter. Follow me on Facebook. Um, uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Uh, you know, download my podcast. Let your friends know. Share, share, share. The only thing that matters in social media is not liking. It's not even commenting. The only thing that matters in social media is sharing. Uh, so please share the content and, and, and the best thing to share is the podcast on blog talk or on one of the podcast apps or youtube all right thank you all for listening uh we'll be back next week same well maybe not the same time but same place talk to you then bye